we can be still and know that you are God. We don't have to have concern about tomorrow because all we have is today. Father, I'm so thankful today that you've promised, for I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. We're thankful that you will help us, that you will strengthen us to do what we can't do. We need wisdom. We need your guidance so desperately. We pray for that wisdom. You've promised it to us. In James 1, you said, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. So we ask for that wisdom this afternoon to give us discernment and then to surrender all to you that only your character would be seen in our lives. In Christ's name I pray. stay over here. Gotcha. I want to look at a topic with you this afternoon called spiritual formation. From where have you come to where do you go? You know, a dear lady... Dear lady outside, handed me a newspaper this afternoon, and I was going to bring it up here and share it with you, and I have, I put it in my case in there unknowingly, but it stated in a newspaper article right here in Loma Linda from the university that all the students at Loma Linda University are being taught spiritual formation right here at Loma Linda University. Folk, we need to understand this. We need to know where it came from. We need to know where it will take people who are involved in spiritual formation. That's what we're going to look at this afternoon. If you have not read this book. You need to get this book. It's by Rick Howard. He was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor for over three decades. Um, that man was extremely committed to the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. In fact, as I was reading his book, I sat back and I thought, why is this man trying so desperately to prove his loyalty to the denomination? He, he stresses it so stringently in his book. Rick Howard does, Dwayne, yes. You've got to get this book, folk, The Omega Rebellion. It's a very good book. This is what he says. The concept of God as revealed to Loyola in these mystical experiences reveal a God who is pantheistic in nature his person existing in the things of his creation. Now, folk, well, let's go on. Loyola developed what is called today his spiritual exercises, which contain all the teachings from which modern spiritual formation was constructed. From these spiritual exercises comes the most important practice of the examine, a daily practice of prayer and meditation essential to spiritual formation. I want you to notice, folk, that Rick Howard connects two, three things here. Ignatius Loyola, his spiritual exercises, and spiritual formation. The examine, Jerry. The examine is the person who goes through the spiritual exercises. And as we're going to find, Jerry, that the examine goes through a series of experiences where he is taught to empty his mind 
and then allow his superior or his mentor to then tell him what he is supposed to do. The exam and Jerry in the spiritual exercises and spiritual formation comes under the control of another person's mind. It's hypnotism, Dwayne. That's exactly what it is. What this, well, we'll see it all here, Jerry, but it's the taking over of another person's mind by somebody else that they can then dictate to them whatever they want them to do. And we will illustrate that in a little while. Now, the head of the Jesuit order, who Howard is talking about here, Ignatius Loyola and the spiritual exercises, Ignatius Loyola was the head of a new order in the Catholic Church in the 1530s. The timing of the founding of the Jesuit order is very instructive. The Protestant Reformation was flourishing and the papacy was crumbling. Loyola's Jesuits were created to flip those tables, to shred Protestantism and to exalt the papacy again. Now, folks, the fact that spiritual formation is going, running rampant through our world tells us, again, where we are in the scheme of, of this earth's history. Because God is about to pour out the latter rain to seal people who will reveal his image and his character for all eternity. Well, that's God's plan for humanity. The devil has a plan for humanity as well. And the devil's plan for humanity is to totally take control of human beings' minds so that they come under the control of other people and ultimately of the devil himself. So spiritual formation is designed to create in humanity the image of Satan himself. That's the ultimate goal of spiritual formation. Now the Jesuit order was created in the 1530s. Notice what Ellen White has to say about the Jesuit order. First triumphs of the Reformation passed, Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience wholly silent, they knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. Jerry, getting back to your question about the examine, this is the ultimate experience of the examine. Because they have come under the control of another person's mind, they no longer reason for themselves. They no longer have a conscience for themselves because somebody else now is telling them what is right, what is wrong. Cadaver obedience. It's exactly what it is, Eugene, cadaver obedience. The gospel of Christ had enabled its adherents to meet danger and endure suffering, undismayed by cold, hunger, toil, and poverty, to uphold the banner of truth in face of the rack, the dungeon, and the stake. To combat these forces, Jesuitism inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers to oppose to the power of truth all the weapons of deception. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power, to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the reestablishment of the papal supremacy. Now, folks, think again 
here we are. We know we're living at the end of time. We know that God is about to pour out the latter rain. When Sunday laws come, God's people make decisions. He will seal those decisions with the power of the Holy Spirit. Those who are sealed with the seal of God will be given the latter rain. They will reflect the image of God in their character. Okay? Now, the devil wants to stop that. The devil wants to stop the creation of a group of people the Bible calls the 144,000. So how is he going to do it? He's going to do it by creating a science of the mind that will impress not the image of God on humanity, but his image on humanity with the hope that if humanity becomes so degraded by spiritual formation, that the Holy Spirit will never be poured out on a group of people because the devil will have taken over this planet. Notice the Jesuits, they were raised up for two purposes, to overthrow Protestantism. Does not spiritual formation today want to stop the ultimate victory of the Reformation in the outpouring of the latter rain and the loud cry of Revelation 18? Doesn't the devil want to stop that? Of course he does. He is scared to death of a group of people who will submit themselves to Jesus Christ. He is scared to death because he knows he can't stop a group of people that are submitted to Christ. This goes on, it says, when appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and the poor, professing to have renounced the world, bearing the sacred name of Jesus who went about doing good. But under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. There was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable, but commendable when they served the interests of the church. Under various guises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings, shaping the policy of nations. They became servants to act as spies upon their masters. You know, folks, Look at this, the shaping, shaping the policy of nations, counseling kings. You look at the United States of America and you say, how can it be that America, how can it be that the Constitution is just being trampled on? How is it that executive orders are allowed to go into print that completely undermine our Constitution. How? It's because those presidents have Jesuits as their advisors. It's because they have Jesuits who are advising the presidents of the United States to do that. Friend, there was only one president in almost the last hundred years that refused to submit to the Jesuit order. One in a hundred years. And they killed him in Dallas, Dwayne, that's right. In broad daylight in Dealey Plaza. Folks, in a hundred years, how much can you do in a hundred years to rewrite and change the face of a nation? I want you to look back at this just real quick. Reason and conscience, holy silence. This is the experience of the examined in spiritual formation. To illustrate it, I can't think of a better person than Edward Smith, the man who was in charge of the Titanic. He was the captain of the, the Titanic. He had crossed the North Atlantic for 26 years. He worked for J.P. Morgan who worked for the Rothschilds, who worked for the Jesuits. Edward Smith worked for the Jesuit order in the Catholic Church. 
Before he start, started across the North Atlantic, a Jesuit priest got on board. His name was Francis Brown. National Geographic, 1986. You can get it at any public library. It will tell you. His name was Francis Brown. He got on board and he snapped pictures of all the people that were about to die. John Jacob Astor, click. Benjamin Guggenheim, click. Isidore Strauss, click. Edward Smith, click. And all the other 300-odd wealthy people that would stop the establishment of the Jesuit Central Bank in America. Francis Brown tells Edward Smith what he's going to do. He's going to sink that ship. So Edward Smith starts across the North Atlantic, told by his master what he is going to do. Heads out across the North Atlantic, folks, 22 knots, eight times he is told to slow the ship down. Folk, he shouldn't have had to be told once. He was told eight times and he never slowed it down. Why didn't he? Because he was on a mission. His reason and his conscience were completely silent. He had been given an order and he was going to carry it out to the death. And the Titanic went down. That's cadaver obedience. That's cadaver obedience. There are a host of other people, John Wilkes Booth and the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and all the other conspirators that sought to destroy the United States government in one night in April of 1865. That's cadaver obedience. Those are people that have embraced the teachings of the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. Jesuits and Loyola were at war with the Reformation and its teachings. You know, Clarence, like they believed in once saved, always saved. And those that believe the same thing are going right in their footsteps. Because that doctrine is not going to the kingdom. Not going to the kingdom. Not once saved, always saved. They hated the Bible that exposed them. They refused to be in submission to Christ. What then was the basis for the Jesuit teachings? If they're not in submission to God, and if they're not in submission to the principles of Scripture and the Ten Commandments, then who are they in submission to? Well, here we go. And this is the experience of the exam. And this is taken from Lewis Walton's book, Omega 2, pages 150 and 151. Notice what he says. Loyola's whole religious life centered around his meditation. He said to have believed he had revelations from God every day. He authored a volume that's still in print entitled The Spiritual Exercise of Ignatius Loyola, a series of meditations by which one is supposed to purge the soul and find oneness with God. Now that sounds good, but how do they do it? This is how they do it. He spends hours in mystical meditation under the control of a director. And within a month, his mind has begun to accept the concept of absolute submission. Friend, in a very strange way, if the superior says that that wall is pink, then the examine believes that wall is pink. Why? Because the superior says so. It's mind control. It's hypnotism. That's what we're looking at here. Submission to whom? To whom are they going to come in submission? Malachi Martin says that after going through the rigors of the spiritual exercises, each man emerged from that weeks-long regimen as a spiritual fighter, completely won over to warfare, an entirely obedient servant of the Pope. 
and ultimately because the Pope, as Jan Markison so illustratively says, the Pope is the devil's girlfriend. So if the person is an obedient servant of the Pope, they have become an obedient servant of the devil, and they are going to receive the devil's stamp of character, which is rebellion against the principles of God, or what we call Sunday. Now, if somebody has become an entirely obedient servant of the Pope, are they ever going to give the third angel's message? That's a joke. Of course they can't. That's impossible. They are working to destroy the third angel's message. They're working to destroy the second angel's message. Have you ever wondered why we don't hear those messages anymore? Why they are foreign amongst us as God's professed people? Why? Think, friends, why don't we hear those messages anymore? It's because from top to bottom in leadership predominantly, you have people that have engaged in spiritual formation and they aren't going to give those messages anymore because they're not working for the God of heaven. It's that simple. That simple. They're in submission to the devil's girlfriend and they're going to do what she tells them to do. The point of the spiritual exercises or spiritual formation is to empty one's mind in meditation. Once this is achieved, the individual is ready to be in total submission to someone else, but not to God. The goal in these exercises is to become a totally obedient slave of the Pope. Now, folk, I don't know if you noticed at the top, there's something else in these spiritual exercises that should send chills up and down our spine if we know anything about the cryptic symbols that Ellen White used to talk about the apostasy that came in amongst us as a people right around the turn from the 19th to the 20th century. Do you remember the cryptic word she used to describe it? Alpha. She called it the alpha of deadly heresy. And she said Omega would come. And she trembled for God's people. Now, folk, what was the essence of the Alpha of Apostasy? Do you remember who the man was who was behind it? John Harvey Kello. I had, there's a dear man. I was in Australia three weeks ago. A delightful, young, uh, not a young man. He's an older man. Delightful man. His name is Ian. Ian for the last two years I've been in Australia, all the time I'm there, he tries to convince me that John Harvey Kellogg did not teach pantheism. I said, Ian, I either am going to believe what Ellen White says, or I'm going to believe you. And I said, Ian, I'm not going to believe you. He said, Bill, fine. I'm going to convince you you're going to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. I said, oh, good. He brought me a copy this year of the book, The Living Temple, by John Harvey Kellogg. He said, take this home. He said, read the first 125 pages. After that, it's all physiology. I said, great, I'll do it. Before I started reading, I prayed, Sheila, just like I was telling you, before you start with the Apocrypha, you pray. And you say, Lord, give me wisdom. I'm entering into something here that, that's dangerous. I want you to protect my mind. After having prayed that prayer and knowing that God answered, I opened the book and I started reading. Page after page after page after page. John Harvey Kellogg puts God in the trees. He puts him in the grass. He puts him in the dirt. He puts him in men. He puts him everywhere. So I got out my pad of paper and I said, Dear Ian, 
I read the first 125 pages of John Harvey Kellogg's book on Can I mean on the Living Temple. <laughs> I said, Ian, it is riddled with pantheism. I said, I'm sorry that you can't see that. But I said, Ian, what Ellen White said was absolutely confirmed by John Harvey Kellogg himself. Folk, if that was in the alpha of apostasy, could it be in the omega of apostasy? The alpha and omega share a common alphabet, so there will be common things in the alpha and the omega of apostasy. The alpha had pantheism, the omega will have pantheism. Ends in an A? You're right. I'll have to think about that. John Harvey Kellogg, Ellen White made it very clear, Testimonies for the Church containing letters to physicians and ministers, page 52. She said this, we need not the mysticism that is in this book. Those who entertain these sophistries will soon find themselves in a position where the enemy can talk with them and lead them away from God. That's what spiritual formation does. That's what pantheism does, and the two are sisters. The enemy can talk to people and lead them from God. It is represented to me that the writer of this book, Living Temple, is on a false track. He has lost sight of the distinguishing truths for this time. He knows not whither his steps are tending. The track of truth lies close beside the track of error. Both tracks may seem to be one to mind, which are not worked by the Holy Spirit, and which therefore are not quick to discern the difference between truth and error. Kellogg lost sight of the great truths of God for this time, lost sight of the three angels' messages, got involved in pantheism, because pantheism is the heart and soul of spiritual formation, we get involved with spiritual formation, we lose track of the distinguishing truths for this time. We lose sight of the purpose for which God has called us as Seventh-day Adventists, and that is the giving of the first, second, and third angel's message. And folk, if we get distracted on anything else, then we have allowed the enemy of souls to talk with us and that he is leading us away from God. It's that simple. Ellen White referred to Kellogg's teaching as the alpha of deadly heresy. She trembled because Omega would come and would seek the destruction of God's remnant people. Again, Rick Howard connected pantheism with the Jesuit order, with the spiritual exercises and spiritual formation. Loyola's understanding of God was pantheistic. From his understanding of God, he derived his spiritual exercises, which is the foundation for the spiritual formation movement of today. The question we would ask is, what does Loyola, spiritual exercises, and spiritual formation have to do with Adventism and Omega? See, when you talk about history, you talk about history, everybody's comfortable because you simply say, well, that happened way in the past. And that doesn't have anything to do with me, and I'm not involved in that, and it's not in Seventh-day Adventism, and I don't know who anybody who's been involved with it. 
So you can talk about that all day, but just keep it in the past. Well, friends, it's not in the past. It's right here, right in our midst, and we're going to have to name a few names today as well. Rick Howard quotes in his book, The Omega Rebellion, page 136. It's also on a website from ANN News, February 3, 2004 at www.adventist.org. And it's under the feature, Church Congregations Increase Focus on Spiritual Formation. If you're writing that down and you look that up and for some reason you can't get into that, I'll give you my email address right now and I'll make sure I'll copy and send it to you. I'll pay, copy and paste and send it to you. My email is in as in Nancy, 3232 at cs.com. This is what it says. Prayerfully consider this quotation from a general conference bulletin informing the church at large of its plans to implement the teaching of spiritual formation around the world. The Adventist World Church created the International Board of Ministerial and Theological Education in September of 2001. That's 11 years ago, friends. 11 years ago. What was the point of this International Board of Ministerial and Theological Education? What was the purpose of this board? It says this, designed to provide overall guidance and standards to the professional training of pastors, Seventh-day Adventist pastors, Seventh-day Adventist evangelists, Seventh-day Adventist theologians, Seventh-day Adventist teachers, Seventh-day Adventist chaplains, and other denominational employees involved in ministerial and religious formation or spiritual formation in each of the church's 13 regions around the world. For the last 11 years, the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination has been taught spiritual formation. The leaders are brought to retreats and they come under the control of directors or mentors and they go through this training. Well, Dwayne, Dwayne, I'll tell you, this has been something that's been going on for a long time. Um, you know, back even in the 50s when uh, Froome and uh, Anderson with questions on doctrine, they tore down the standard of truth, Dwayne, and it just opened the floodgate to pro-Catholic teaching in our midst. Wayne, I'll tell you, um, if you email me, I'll send it to you. I don't have it here with me. To in3232 at cs.com. There, there is a lady that lives in the, um, let's see, the U.S. Virgin Islands. And she got a copy of a newsletter I did on spiritual formation. And she emailed me and she said, that is shocking material. She said, I could not believe when you wrote that in there. She said, I'm going to research that for myself. She sent me her research. She has a listing of all the men that were on this committee. That, yeah. So you, you write to me. I'll email her and say, send me that list again. And she will. I know one person who was on the committee. 
right there. Among those on this board who implemented the teaching of spiritual formation to Adventist leaders worldwide was Ted Wilson. Now, let me say this. Let me, let me say one thing here, and then I'll get you your question. Folks, Ted Wilson was on the committee. Okay? His name is there. Now, how he voted, whether he said yay to having spiritual formation, or whether he said nay, I have not been able to find that information. I asked this lady in the Virgin Islands, I said, tell me who voted yay and who voted nay. She said, she wrote to me after about three weeks, she said, that information is nowhere to be found. Okay? So, by putting this picture and this man's name up here, I am not saying that he indeed voted for spiritual formation. However, I am saying that he was on the committee. Harold, yes. No, no. I'll tell you what Rick Howard said. Harold, I want to respond to what you said. Um, as I stated before I actually brought it down to today, see, when we talk in historical terms, it's easy to accept. But when it comes down to a person who is living, who we can watch on YouTube or maybe some of us have met, then it becomes a whole different issue. And all I would say, Harold, um, not to challenge per se what you said, but nevertheless, Harold, to respond to that, and that would be this. Harold, there are a lot of people um, that, that we talk about when we discuss current events and prophecy that I have talked about right here in this church. Uh, we have talked about Barack Obama. We have talked about um, Nancy Pelosi. We have talked about Harry Reid. We've talked about Tony Blair. We've talked about a host of people. And Harold, they are alive too. But Harold, because of the positions these people occupy, it is well nigh impossible. I tried personally. I tried and I called the general conference. I did, Harold. It was impossible to speak to Ted Wilson. So, if that's possible, Harold, I would love to sit down. I would love to sit down with this, with this man because I have heard in various places where I have been. And let's, let's make another point clear here, folks. This is not about Ted Wilson as a person. I have been told that he is a very gracious, a very kind, and a very humble man. Okay? I had a lady when I was in Tennessee almost two months ago, giving this same message. And a lady raised her hand and she said, well, all I know is, is that 20 years ago, Ted Wilson, when my family and I were moving, he personally came over to my house and lo helped me load up my U-Haul so I could move. You see, Harold, this is not about, is he a nice person? That's not the issue here. The issue is principle. That's all we're looking at. So, go ahead.
responsible to do that, then I would do that. Um, again, if I look at a tree and the tree has oranges on it, and I say it's an orange tree, I'm not attacking the tree. I'm just simply saying, that's an orange tree. And that's all we're trying to do here. I'm not attacking this man. I pray for this man. I pray for Ted Wilson. I'm not attacking his character. But I am looking at and saying, this dastardly, horrific, satanic thing came in amongst us as God's professed people 11 years ago, and some people are responsible for that. Some people need to be held accountable for that. And one of the persons on that board was that man. Now, there were a host of other men as well, a host of other men. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, the actual amount of authority that the president of the general conference has in committees and in universities, he's, he's not the head of universities. He's at the head of the general conference. Decisions at, at university levels, ma'am, are made by people at universities. I think he would serve maybe in advisory role to give advice, to give counsel, to give direction, but to actually dictate policy? No. Ma'am, I believe to a degree to a degree, that's a true statement. But ma'am, we all have individual responsibility. We're all responsible. You know, when Joshua, as we said this morning in Joshua 24, when Joshua said, choose you this day whom ye will serve, ma'am, he looked in the eyes of every single person there at uh, Mount Ebal and said, "You, it's your decision, it's your choice. Now, of course, ma'am, when the leader is faithful and walking with God, the people typically in Bible times, they would follow the leader. But uh, we all have choices. We all have choices. Thanks, Eddie. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, like at 430, we'll have the Q&A and write them on a piece of paper and be happy to discuss them. Again, getting back, Dwayne, to your question about, you know, when did all this get going? This has been going on for a long time, folks. Uh, these three wavy lines that we see in the church logo that we say, oh, you know, that's the... Uh, the uh, cross, and this is an open Bible, and this is the Holy Spirit. The only question I have is, is why is, are there churches all over where I live in central Florida that on their church marquees, they have that same symbol? Why do Pentecostals and Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians, why do they have that on their, on their signs in front of their church? It's because they're all unified. And that's why professed Seventh-day Adventists have it on their letterhead and on their signs as well. It's no longer three angels. Now, make sure you write down your question. This was a statement that was made at the General Conference in July of 2010. Now, I would encourage all of you 
to go back and listen to that sermon that Ted Wilson gave at the beginning of the general conference when he became the president. There were many good aspects of that sermon. Many, many good aspects. This was something that he said. And sir, getting back to your question, this is what Rick Howard quoted on the back leaf of his book. Ted Wilson said this. Notice what he said. Stay away from non-biblical spiritual disciplines or methods, there it is, of spiritual formation that are rooted in mysticism such as contemplating prayer, centering prayer in the emerging church movement in which they are promoted. Now, folk, if, if there was a period there and he said amen and walked off the platform, that would have been an awesome fantastic statement. But that wasn't the end of his sermon. You go back and listen to it, and I encourage you to do so. Right after he said this, this was his advice. Look within the Seventh-day Adventist church. He then went on, and you can hear it on the tape, he said, look to the pastors and leaders that are guiding this movement. Go back and listen to it, friends. Now you say, Bill, you're, you're attacking him. No, I want you to think about this for just a minute, okay? Nine years before he made that statement at the general conference, he was on a committee where spiritual formation came in like a landslide, okay? where pa Adventist pastors, evangelists, teachers, educators were being trained in spiritual formation, okay? Ten years later, no, full well knowing what happened in 2001, he said, stay away from spiritual formation. Now, shouldn't his advice have been, immerse yourself in the Bible and spirit of prophecy? Shouldn't that have been his counsel? Apparently, I'm having trouble with my uh, PowerPoint here all of a sudden. That was timely, wasn't it? Oh, the plug came out. At least I didn't trip over it. Where is Dr. Farmer? Sheila, did you know your husband was a doctor? No, where is William?
come right up. Very little. Thanks, William. Ring the air for me. Ring the air. Thank you, Kate. There we go. Um, I'd like to re quote this again. Stay away from non biblical spiritual disciplines or methods of spiritual formation that are rooted in mysticism, such as contemplating prayer, centering prayer in the emerging church movement in which they are promoted. And then the council was, look within the Seventh-day Adventist church. I think the one question I would ask that I would love an answer to If I knew that for 10 years, spiritual formation had been taught through Adventist pastors, teachers, educators, evangelists, and church leaders, why would I 10 years later say to people, stay away from spiritual formation, but just look within the Seventh-day Adventist church? Focus spiritual formation is being taught in the Adventist church to the leaders in Adventism, and it is, why would I tell people to look to the pastors in Adventism who are trained in spiritual formation? To me, now I understand, and, you know, somebody thinking I'm personally attacking this man, that, that has nothing to do with it. I'm trying to understand the logic. I'm just simply trying to understand the logic of that. To me, that sounds like there's been a fox in a hen house that's been killing chickens for 10 years. And along comes several new little baby chicks. And there's a guy standing out at the, at the gate of the, the hen house and he says, you know, there's a fox. I know there's a fox in the hen house that's been there for the last 10 years. And he's devoured every chicken that's gone inside. But my counsel to you, baby chicks, go in the hen house. Now, I don't understand the logic of that. I don't understand the logic. Spiritual formation or the spiritual exercises are mystical and pantheistic in focus, claiming that God is everywhere. Loyola and Kellogg taught pantheism. Ellen White called the pantheistic teachings of Kellogg the alpha of deadly heresies. She trembled because something similar at the end of time would come, and she called it Omega. Throughout the world field, Adventist leaders are being trained and excuse my English, but really, I, I don't, I'm not asking for uh, forgiveness because this is what it is, friends. It is satanic garbage. It's being used to make God's professed people willing, obedient servants of the Pope. And, folk, if I understand the Bible right, there are two mysteries, and we'll close with this thought. There are two mysteries. 
that we find in Scripture. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, talks about the first mystery. Colossians 1, verse 27 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now that is the mystery of God that will possess the 144,000. They will reflect the character of Christ in their life. That is the mystery of God that he wants for humanity. Spiritual formation, spiritual exercises, they want to create in man another mystery. And that mystery is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's read that together. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. In fact, let's start with verse 3. It says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day the second coming shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of lawlessness, or of hell, or of sin, be revealed the son of hell, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that's called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And then verse 7 says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Folks, we're either going to be stamped with the mystery of iniquity, which is the exaltation of self. It's ourselves being in rebellion against the principles of the law of God. Or we will be stamped with the mystery of God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Spiritual formation, friends. Spiritual formation. And those who are involved in spiritual formation and those who take spiritual formation will receive the stamp of evil, the stamp of rebellion, the stamp of man in rebellion against his maker. But those who are in submission to Jesus Christ and Him alone will receive the stamp of God. They will receive the seal of God and the latter reign. Folk, I know where I want to be. Let's all pray each and every day that we will choose the mystery of God. Wayne, the ultimate, the ultimate of spiritual formation is what Ellen White said in this quote, Review and Herald, March 18, 1884. Notice what she says. We'll start from the top. The Lord has a controversy with his professed people in these last days. His professed people are Seventh-day Adventists. In this controversy that God has with Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Adventist leaders will take a course directly opposite to that pursued by Nehemiah. Nehemiah exalted the law of God. The leadership will denigrate it and exalt man-made tradition. They will not only, men in leadership positions, will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, but they will try to keep it from others by burying it beneath the rubbish of custom and tradition. In churches, the context says, folk, that it's talking about Seventh-day Adventist churches, and in camp meetings, large gatherings in the open air, Seventh-day Adventist ministers, and I'm going to add in, in light of our study today, Seventh-day Adventist ministers and leaders who have taken spiritual formation and have, have come under the control of another power will urge Seventh-day Adventists of the necessity of keeping the first day of the week. 
this, friend, is the ultimate goal of spiritual formation. It's for Seventh-day Adventists to embrace the mark of the beast. Absolutely, Dwayne. Absolutely. We must understand who we are, what our messages are, where we're going. We must understand those things. Here's another statement from Great Controversy 608. As the storm approaches, the Sunday storm approaches, a large class of Seventh-day Adventists who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified. They did not receive the mystery of God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. They believed in once saved, always saved. They lived in sin. They were not sanctified through obedience to the truth. They abandoned their position and joined the ranks of the opposition. Friends, it doesn't say they leave the denominational church. It says they abandon their position on our messages. And they join the ranks of the opposition while they remain in the organized church. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they've come to view matters in nearly the same light. When the Sunday test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. Adventist leaders who have taken spiritual formation that are talented, that have pleasing address, that are nice men who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. Folks, the great controversy is not about nice people. I'm going to take the position this afternoon, and you can argue with me if you want, that's okay. But I'm going to take the position that if you ever went to the president of the general conference in 31 AD, and you sat down with Caiaphas, I will guarantee you that that man was a nice man. I guarantee you that he could even be friendly because he was the consummate politician. He knew how to play people. He knew how to play the game, ma'am. Friend, it's not about nice people. It's not about characters. It's not about personalities. Understand me. It's about principles. It's about principles. It's about a war that we are in between right and wrong, between Christ and Satan, between the true people of God wanting to finish the Reformation versus those who were dilly-dallying with spiritual formation and teaching it to God's professed leaders. That's the issue, friends. Let's keep it there. That's the issue. Let's kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the information that you have shared with us this afternoon. Thank you for the teaching of history. Thank you that we have been given the warning, if we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. Father, forgive us as a people. Forgive us as a denomination. Forgive us as leaders. Forgive the men, Father, that brought this heinous, this heinous, deceptive art of the devil himself into the very midst of your last day people. Forgive them, Father, for what they have done to destroy, to destroy 
and to take your people to the lake of fire. Father, forgive them for what they've done. Help them to realize what they've done and to make amends. Father, people are being destroyed. They're being destroyed. They're deceiving your people with all kinds of crazy doctrine and conning them off as truth and doing it in such a politically lying way. Father, I pray that you would anoint our eyes with eye salve, that we can see we have a soul to save or to lose, and we have an influence. We have an influence, Lord, over people. I pray that you would strengthen us to discern issues, to discern warring principles in a great controversy. Father, in a special way today, in a special way, help Ted Wilson. Help him to stand. As Ellen White said, to stand for the right. Though the heavens fall, we don't need more politicians, Father. We need men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost soul are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle is to the pole. Men who will stand, not, not waver, not play political games, not try to save political positions, but men who will stand for what is right. Though the heavens fall, Father, empower, empower Elder Wilson and all the leaders in Adventism to be men like that. Men who will be as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Father, I pray for those men. Bless them. Bless them to hasten, to hasten your coming by the proclamation of the messages that make us your people, even those in Revelation 14. Thank you for your love to us. Thank you for your great mercy. In Christ's